given the same challenges, the same economic situation that they're in, the same weather, if people are implementing soil health practices, 80% of those people who are doing soil health practices are optimistic about profitability in the future. State soil health initiatives, or coalitions, exist now or are being developed in 29 states. How is Montana approaching soil health at the statewide level, and how can Montanans participate? In this episode of Voices from the Field, Mike Morris, INCAT's Southwest Regional Director, talks with Cole Mannix, who facilitates the developing Montana soil outreach effort, and in RCS Montana soil health specialist Marnie Thompson, along with INCAT regenerative grazing specialist Linda Poole, about soil health programs in and beyond Montana. Let's listen. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's podcast. I'm Mike Morris, Southwest Regional Director for the National Center for Appropriate Technology, better known as NCAT. I'm a researcher and writer for NCAT's ATRA program, which is also known as the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, and I'm based in Durango, Colorado. The topic of our podcast today is soil health, and more specifically, statewide programs that are promoting soil health. You know, I did a little internet reading this morning, and I learned that 17 states have already passed healthy soils legislation. This is 2021, December 2021, and set up some kind of a statewide soil health program. And there are about 12 other states that have legislation drafted or programs that are pending. So there's really no question this is a national trend. It's an important trend. And most of our states are already in the process of creating some type of soil health program, which is something I think is fantastic. Now, Montana is one of those 12 states in the pending category, meaning that they don't, they don't yet have a full statewide program. And today we're gonna to hear from three people who are trying to make a statewide healthy soil program a reality in Montana. And this is an effort that they're calling the Montana Soil Outreach Program. So I'd like to introduce them to you. Marnie Thompson is the state soil health specialist with NRCS, which as you all know is the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. And Marnie joins us from Fort Benton, Montana. Uh, Cole Mannix is part of an extended family that has ranched in Montana's Blackfoot Valley since 1882. And he also served as the Associate Director of the Western Landowners Alliance. And he lives in Helena, Montana. And third but not least is Linda Poole, who is a regenerative grazing specialist with ATRA. And she's a colleague of mine here at NCAT. And uh, she's also a shepherd and she lives on a ranch near Malta, Montana. So with that really quick introduction, I'm gonna start with you, Marnie. And can you give us, for those who aren't really familiar with this topic, can you give us a, a working definition of soil health and maybe say a little bit about what it is and why it's important to NRCS? You bet. In a very basic definition, soil health is just really the ability of the soil to function and grow a crop, which is important for all of us. It impacts the food that we eat, the crops that we grow, and the grass that we have for livestock. Basically, it comes down, um, and what we're learning more about is the microorganisms in the soil that help soil function. The more microorganisms and the diversity of microorganisms in the soil help soil infiltrate and store water, which has become extremely important, especially this year, last year with the drought. And those microorganisms also provide nutrients for the plant and a bunch of other things. But when soil health decreases, um, we see you know, water and wind erosion, which we've seen up here in Northern Montana and sometimes even near Billings where we've closed highways and there's been accidents because of blowing soil. When soil health decreases, we see pests and disease, which creates problems for farmers and ranchers because they have to increase their inputs, which is very costly. Also, production can decrease and then producers have, again, more inputs um, with fertilizer. But with the more knowledge we are finding out about soil health and microbiology in the soil, there's a ton of tools that can be used to improve soil health. And we are seeing some fabulous examples with 
producers all over in the state of Montana that are being really progressive and trying different things and are seeing really great improvements in the soil. And along with that really is the goal is to decrease inputs for farmers and ranchers that helps them stay on the land and produces healthier soils, which relates to healthier food for us all. And so I think that's why soil health is important to everyone. Great. Thanks, Marnie. I did want to follow up a little bit on that because you're with NRCS. And I know NRCS used to be called the Soil Conservation Service and, and has always been a champion for soil. How has that changed over the years? Is this the same kind of the same message out of NRCS? Or when we talk about soil health and the soil health program, is there something that's new in that uh, within NRCS? I think there is. There's a lot more awareness and more education trying to learn, you know, what is soil health and how can we improve it and how can we find tools to help farmers and ranchers improve their soil. So, and we have done, you know, some new things, a lot of new education um, and new practices that help promote soil health in the NRCS. Great. And then I did want to ask you, Marty, could you tell us a little more about your background and how you got into this, uh, this line of work? Yeah, I grew up on a ranch in Townsend, Montana, went to Montana State University and got a range degree and then have worked in NRCS for 25 years in many locations around the state and in several different capacities. And so about 15 years ago, I saw the slake test, which is just a demonstration that shows soil health. And it really was an aha moment, totally changed the way I thought. And from then on, I have tried to learn as much as I can about soil health, working with farmers and ranchers to find tools for them to help them improve soil health. I've traveled many different states and got to see a lot of different speakers and learn. And so that's kind of how I got into it. Okay, Um, well, let's uh, turn it over to Cole Mannix. I want to turn to you next and ask you to tell us about the Montana soil outreach effort. Uh, What is it? Who's part of that effort? Thanks, Mike. Montana soil outreach effort is really a big listening effort that is taking place. We know that other states have created programs, and yet we don't want to assume that we know what's needed in Montana. We've got some diverse landscapes in the state where very different types of agriculture are happening. Again, the listening process is so important. So we know from our farmers and ranchers across the state, what are the needs? How can they better be supported in managing soils? We don't wanna presuppose we know what, what the answer to that is. And so the Montana Soil Outreach Project is not necessarily an effort to create a, a program in Montana, but it's an effort to as thoroughly as we possibly can understand uh, what are people's interests and concerns when it comes to managing soils and how can they be better supported. And so beginning this past summer, we began having conversations about how to do that listening. And we began shaping tools to uh, a a short survey and a longer version of a survey that allows people to go in more depth and a series of listening sessions, focus groups that will take place in person in the spring of 2022 telling people that those outreach tools and that those focus groups are happening and shaping the surveys themselves. And then um, every week we have a a group, we call it a working group, sort of a steering committee that's open and allows people to participate as they can. And that group has done the work to shape the surveys and to um, reach out uh, with their agricultural groups and the meetings and the annual conventions and, and all that to share that this is happening. And then that same group will continue meeting through the process of focus groups in the spring. And the goal is to create a report that will be ready in August of 2022 that says, here's what we learned. And here's some of the recommendations that our working group has gleaned from this outreach effort. And hopefully that will identify for Montana, where are the gaps, if there are gaps, and where might we, you know, spend our time and energy on this soil topic? If people, how do they want to be supported? So that's what the Montana Soil Outreach effort is. And right now it is, it's essentially a URL, Montana Soil Outreach at macdnet.org. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but by now people can just Google Montana Soil Outreach and they will find that webpage and that's how they participate. Great. Thanks, Cole. That all makes sense. Can you say a little more? I'm interested in the, the process and the coalition and the way you're trying to bring people together. 
Could you say more about who have been some of the participants? And are you able to tell us a little bit, have you learned, what have you learned? Uh, I know you haven't written the report yet, but do you, do you have some some sense? Have you What have you been hearing from the people you've been speaking to? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, different folks involved. Our, our lead partners on the effort are the Montana Association of Conservation Districts and also the Montana Watershed Coordination Council. But there's a, a broad range of farmers and ranchers and NGOs and state and federal agencies that have been just part of these conversations. You know, we formed this specific soil health outreach effort in the spring of 2021. But th there's been conversations ongoing the last several years across the state as interest in soil kind of has seen a resurgence about, you know, there's a lot of activity. A lot of groups are running programs. A lot of groups are doing education, but there's almost so much going on that it sort of feels like this has been an opportunity to consolidate efforts and to learn what everybody's doing. Um, and so the, basically the effort has a couple of lead partners that are helping to organize calls and helping to be where the funding flows to do the outreach effort. But it's, as I said, it's also just a, an open weekly working group that is, there's a standing invite to everybody who's heard about the effort to participate in that and share their perspective. And could you tell us a little more about your background, Cole, and how you, how you got involved in this? Yeah, uh, basically just, um, I am the only city boy uh, of, <laughs> of uh, I live in town of an of extended family that all ranches together in the Blackfoot Valley, but I... You know, I care very much about intact working lands, both from the perspective of our family's business being productive and trying to stay profitable amidst a lot of change, and also from the perspective of just intact ecology and, you know, holding water and having as much biodiversity as we possibly can. And to me, the profitable ranching long term is very aligned with intact, intact ecology. Those two things have to go together. And so I've spent a lot of my just young career um, working on wildlife questions and natural resource questions. Some of that from the perspective of working with ranchers to start a meat company. Some of that from working for a nonprofit called Western Landowners Alliance that worked on things like the Farm Bill and things like the Endangered Species Act. And so that's kind of where I have come into these circles where we're talking about how do we align incentive, policy incentives and how do we align education and martial resources to better support the folks that are doing this work on the ground. Very good. All right. Well, let's get Linda Poole into the conversation. Linda, can you tell us a little bit about how NCAD and ATRA are involved in all this and how you, how you got involved personally? Yeah, I'm pretty excited about the entire project. You know, I'm new with NCAD. I've only been with the outfit for eight months or so, and I've been kind of at the junction of ranching and conservation and uh, sustainable rural communities for a long time. So getting my feet on the ground with NCAT at the same time that this outreach effort is going on about soils has been so incredibly helpful. Yeah, I've lived in Montana for 22 years, so I'm not new here. But to look at what's going on through the lens of NCAT and our mission of helping people build resilient communities through practical solutions that help people help the land conserve natural resources, this is just such a natural fit. The idea of a bunch of interested entities, whether they're agencies, nonprofits, farmers, ranchers, all being brought together into a group to, to say, what matters to you about soil? You know, what could help ranchers and farmers feel like they, they've got all that they need for support in taking care of their soils? And that feeds directly back to what we're trying to do with NCAT, you know, resilient communities. And at the same time that I'm participating in this group, we've got this new program going in NCAT called Soil for Water. And there's such a lot of overlap in the process that we're using. Of course, the goals overlap, you know, the goal of Soil for Water is to catch and hold more water in soils. And the way to do that is to build soil health. So of course, that all goes together. But also kind of how we're going about it. What we're doing with Soil for Water is we're listening. We want to hear from people. We don't want to presuppose that, you know, just knowing the five soil health principles is going to be enough because 
every place is different. All the contexts are different. People have different experiences. So how can we develop a way to listen and to share information and build success together? That's really kind of the crux of what we're trying to do for Soil for Water. And it's completely congruent with sitting in the room with Marnie and with Cole and and with Montana Association of Conservation Districts and the Watershed Coordination Council and just learn about this and what does the state need. And then what NCAT would like to do is then be able to see what's our unique role in how we can help those good things happen. Have a diverse group of people identify needs and challenges. And then we think about given who we are, how can we help? And so I'm really grateful to be part of the group. Nice. Great. Well, you got me curious. Let's try to dig in a little deeper and try to put this into a context. Full disclosure, I love Montana. I used to live in Montana, in case you all didn't know that. And so I I do know some about uh, how Montana is different and how it's so special. But I would like to hear your thoughts on that. And how do you see Montana in comparison to some other programs, other states that have some type of a soil health effort, too, that I'm very familiar with our new programs in Texas and Colorado, where I live now. There's also a very good program in New Mexico, which is an older program. And I I get your point, Cole, this may not end up looking quite like any of those, but could you say something about why Montana needs this? What What are the special issues or what's different about Montana as you go forward and think about how to promote soil health? And maybe I'll circle back to Marnie first on that one. Give us some some of your thoughts on what is different about Montana? How does it compare to some other states? Or maybe are there other states you're looking at as good models? I think Montana is a big state and it's a very diverse state and they produce, you know, lots of different crops and they all have their unique system. And so I think this outreach effort will be very helpful to determine what will work here. And we may take ideas from other states, but we do want to make it our own. And some soil programs that I'm familiar with and have looked into a little bit, um, South Dakota has a soil health coalition that, that, that has been very successful. And then North Dakota has a grazing coalition that is really relative to soil health, and they have also been pretty successful. And then I think there's other ones that we've learned from in Colorado also. Um, So it's just about getting ideas from other states and trying to figure out what works here because we want to make it our own. And could you say more about that South Dakota program? Is there something about it that stands out in your mind or makes it good? I think what stands out in my mind there in South Dakota is it's led by their board is all farmers and ranchers that promote soil health and do soil health on their own properties. And so I think that's unique because they have the unique experience and then they can help promote it to other producers, which I think is really the most successful. Great. Linda or Cole, any other thoughts on what's different about Montana or what's needed in Montana? Yeah, I'd kind of like to follow up on what Marnie uh, said. We're both fans of the South Dakota way that they're doing things. And one of the things that I like about it is in addition to being kind of led by producers, it's really taking the approach of what do producers need to succeed? And the producers are the ones who have their hands in the soil, whose profitability, whose, um, whose livelihood whose family traditions are at stake if things go wrong. And one of the things that they did that I think is really intriguing is a study on how the implementation of soil health principles being kind of like a soil health champion, how that affects the optimism levels, the mental health, and how just basically how farmers and ranchers feel about the business that they're in and came back with some really solid information from a hundred different farmers and ranchers that given the same challenges, the same economic situation that they're in, the same weather, if people are implementing soil health practices, 80% of those people who are doing soil health practices are optimistic about profitability in the future. And when you talk to people with traditional practices, that number, depending upon the way the question is answered, is somewhere between 40 and 60%. So just this idea of 
you know, we're all needing to have profitable businesses, but we also need to have a good quality of life. And to think that just making these changes can really help people feel better about what they're doing. To me, that's, that's important. It brings it back to the fact that there's this one kind of an elegant solution that takes care of the land, takes care of the soil, takes care of the water, takes care of the wildlife, which is really important to me. Sounds like it is to coal too. You know, takes care of the nutrient density of our food and gives us more hope about the future. So, I mean, what's not to love about that? It's really just a question of how to do it in the best way for the state of Montana. And Linda, can you, uh, I know a lot of our listeners are very, very knowledgeable about this, but could you um, just mention a few of the methods, the actual techniques that can be successful in improving soil health or that have been working in Montana? Sure. I think that Marnie and Cole both have better, have, have a better footing in this. You know, I think one of the things I'd like to talk about on that, Mike, are, are things that we have heard the typical thing. Well, that'll never work here. And it might be true. You know, cover crops, diverse plantings, plantings of diverse species that can really build your soil health in a short amount of time that are planted in between cash crops. If people are familiar with Gabe Brown, he's done so much good work with that. He's got 16 inches of average annual precip, and we don't (laughs) across a lot of Montana. So how do we take and adapt that? You know, uh, some of the other things that work in other places are, you know, they've already been working here. and We've got some great examples. And you look at what Roger and Betsy Enderland have done, what Dale and Janet Vseth have done, what so many other ranchers have done in Montana with good grazing management, coming up with, with planned grazing that boosts their soil health at the same time. I've watched Vseth go through this drought, less than four inches of precip this year, and they have built so much health into their system that they're going through the drought that's, you know, sadly might be the end of some operations around here and their cattle look good and their profitability looks great. So that's one that looks like it's going to be a winner. I've also been hearing about the idea of integrating livestock more into our small grains. And I think that that's kind of a place where Montana might have a lot to gain. I think Cole is someone who's already working on that. And I wonder if you'd like to say more about that, Cole. Sure. Yeah. And I, you know, really resonate with what both Marnie and Linda have already said. And I'll get to the crop livestock integration piece too, but I, but I, I wanted to jump back really quickly to just what about Montana? You know, every place is unique. And so I'm not, I don't want to try to have a uniqueness contest. I think that there's really two things from my perspective. One that makes the Dakota programs, both what's going on in North and South Dakota, kind of attractive is just being landowner led. Some of this, you know, comes from my, my own background with Western Landowners Alliance. But, you know, it's one thing to tour Gabe Brown's ranch or to read an article by Greg Judy. And it's another thing to be like, okay, in Helm, in the Blackfoot Valley, where we don't do much cropping at all for various reasons in Western Montana, we, okay, we've wanted to push our calving season later for various reasons, trying to get our winter feed costs under control. And we've wanted to util- change the way we utilize some of our, our rangeland. But as soon as we start to think about calving up higher a little bit you know, later into the season in May and June, and then we start to combine that with when you can go on your public land lease and then we start to combine that with the presence of wolves and grizzly bears you realize that it's pretty hard to to tackle the soil health challenge without tackling everything at once (laughs) and so it's more about the principles are one thing and i think they resonate with people across landscapes in a pretty intuitive way and then the how of applying the principle is why it's so important to have producer leadership on these programs And so I wanted to just emphasize that that's one of the components of any program that I think will be important. And, you know, when it comes to back, just back to my own experience on the family ranch, you're not going to generally buy more land if if your income comes from agriculture in order to change the way you're able to, you know, vary the intensity of impact on grazing and then an increase the amount of rest. You're kind of fixed in that way, but to partner with farmers in not so distant landscapes that have mostly not been using livestock in, in their systems for some time. If you can solve kind of the, 
the water and fencing challenges and if you can build relationships with those farmers if they see the need and if they become interested i think that could be a way that our family which is not going to have the capacity to buy new land may be able to build relationships in the future with folks that are in more cropland country and we could you know improve and maintain or even improve our performance from a livestock perspective at the same time as decreasing our costs from a feed perspective. And that's a, as much of an economic benefit as it is an ecological benefit as our soils improve. And so if that at the same time allows the farmer to decrease the amount of fertilizer that they're using, um, maybe decrease the amount of chemical, terminate a little bit more with livestock rather than like with chemical, that maybe they become a little bit more profitable too. And at the same time, soil health benefits. And so there seems to me to be a lot of just common interest in continuing to kind of suss that out and tease it out and see what kind of appetite there is in Montana. So Cole, uh, you're, you're so right about landowner led and, and I, I completely agree with that. I, I'm curious as you kind of visualize the future of this, this effort and how might that work? Would this be all word of mouth and like you were mentioning, talking to neighbors sort of informally one-on-one? Would there be a a more of an organized forum where people could share these kinds of, you know, very specific, very, very uh, local uh, strategies that may be the things that are needed. Do you have any crystal ball or any vision of what that would end up looking like so that landowners do feel like they're continuing to lead this effort and that they're really talking to each other? Mm, I don't have a crystal ball. But I would say that the challenge of landowner leadership is that they're busy and very landscape specific. And, you know, they're thinking about day to day and it's really hard to organize at a regional or statewide level if that organization is is necessary. And so that's why there is a role for agencies and there is a role for NGOs and and it can't just be landowner led. And for me, that's partly why the conservation districts are so potentially promising is that here is this established infrastructure that has history and that already, you know, in Montana, something like 538 directors sit on the 58 conservation district boards. And those, the people that sit on those boards, you know, are part of our agricultural organizations. They're deeply integrated into the communities. And as it becomes more and more important to utilize the water that does fall, and to minimize how much soil does blow. It's those folks who have to solve the how, (laughs) how in our landscape. And so it's it's sort of, at least it seems to me like you have the opportunity for the best of both worlds where it's sort of led by folks from the local landscape and yet there is an infrastructure to organize, (laughs) to educate ourselves, to if more resources are needed, to advocate for those resources. And so I, I think there is promise in that conservation district watershed group energy and and infrastructure that we are fortunate to have in in Montana. Great. I want to circle back to you, Marnie, uh, because you work for an agency and and maybe ask you the same question. As you think of the, let's assume this, let's hope this is really successful. And how would NRCS continue to be involved in it? And do you share Cole's vision of really landowners leading the effort? I do support the landowners leading the effort. As far as how NRCS can be evolved, I think we'll find some of that out when we talk to producers. But what I do hear from producers is the effort that we've already been doing for the past 11 years is education. We've done for 11 years now, soil health workshops every year. They've been in different locations. We've brought in speakers. We have producers producer panels that talk about what they're doing to helping improve soil health. And I think that has been very successful in that in 2019, we had our first ever soil health symposium. It was a two-day workshop in Billings and it was sold out with a huge waiting list. And we are again doing that again this February, two-day soil health symposium, able to bring in some bigger name speakers and the registration is already double of what it was in 2019. And so I think education has been huge and producers get really excited about it because they start understanding how the soil functions. And I've heard a lot of producers talk about, man, I wished I was younger because I'm older and now I can't do all the things that I'd like to do. And I've also heard 
you know, it makes it fun again because they start learning how things function and they get to see change. And that's just super encouraging to NRCS staff really to see that and just help people understand and make changes that are beneficial for all of us. And Marnie, you've worked, uh, I'm sure, with the conservation districts and some of the watershed groups in Montana. Do you agree with Cole that gr those groups are logical to continue to lead this effort? I do. And they've also done a lot of education. We have little small workshops in counties that are usually sponsored by the conservation district and just continuing that effort for that local leadership to continue. Okay. Well, we have a few minutes left. I guess I'll just maybe ask any of you if you have lessons learned that you've been doing this for quite a while now. You've been trying to get this uh, rolling. Anybody um, have anything they would like to offer up as uh, something you've learned through the process? Maybe starting with you, Linda, it's kind of your turn to take a shot. I guess one of the things that I've learned is just how lucky Montana is. You know, we've always been, what do they say, a, you know, kind of a very dispersed small town of a state. You know, people tend to know each other and to have the depth of expertise and dedication to the idea of building a better Montana through better soil health and through collaborative efforts. I love that. I think it's really a good thing. I think it's something that as I work for NCAT, which, you know, works all across the, the U.S., it makes me appreciate even more about Montana and the benefit that we have of working together in this way. You know, another thing that I don't know that I'm learning so much is maybe just somehow realizing is that we've always talked about Montana as the last best place for prairie grasslands, for cold water fisheries, for, you know, free roaming elk and those big carnivores that caused so much problem for the Mannix Brothers Ranch and other people in, in Montana. But, you know, just the idea that one of the best ways that we can take care of the wild things is to take care of the farmers and ranchers. One of the best ways to take care of the water is to take care of the soil. And I'm just so happy that this team is in place and that we can learn from the work that's going on in other states and other places, but we've got the right people to listen and learn how to make that work in the best way for Montana. Well, anything you'd mention as a, a lesson learned through the process so far? I think for me, the main lessons learned is just to refuse to let soil and natural resources be a political issue, to, to refuse to kind of play into the binaries that we can get caught in, because, you know, the land and our watersheds are such a fundamental common denominator that we share. John Wesley Powell, when he first came out here, I mean, one of the things that makes Montana and other parts of the West unique is that we are, we are just determined by the water and the way it flows through our landscapes. And we have to become more skillful about the way we kind of take our direction from what the land allows. And then I think that's back to, you know, just right out of grad school, I was trying to decide whether to continue down the path of being a Jesuit priest or whether to like do kind of find a way to be part of the agriculture that my family, where I came from. And I discovered, you know, back to NCAT, small is beautiful and Schumacher and appropriate technology we have to get back to, okay, this is what the land sort of determines. It sort of sets the sidebars of what's possible. And we have to start with the people in the place and the technologies available to them to try to figure out the how that allows us to implement the principles. And that's, to me, that's, there's no binaries there. That's just, we all share that in common in Montana. We, share, we face a lot of common challenges and we're here on this landscape and we're here with the people we're here with. And that's where we have to start. You know, that's where that's the only place to work. Well said, Cole. Marnie, I want to give you a chance to, what have you learned in your time working on this? I guess what I've learned in my time, and it encourages me and excites me, is just the level of interest in soil health from landowners to nonprofits to agency to even people in urban settings. When we start talking about the relationship between human health and soil health and soil health and their food and nutrition. And I'm just super excited about the interest there because I think we can all, you know, 
go around that common goal of just improving the health of our soils because it really does affect everyone and a lot of different things. Great. Cole, um, I do want to come back to you. And if, if people have heard this and they're interested in getting involved, how would a farmer or rancher get involved in, in the Montana soil outreach effort? I think the best way is for them to just plug Montana soil outreach into their Google search engine <laughs> rather than me spitting out the URL. And basically there you will find an ability to take a couple versions of a survey, a short and a long version to sign up for uh, focus groups that we'll be holding this uh, coming spring. There's also a, an email or a phone number that you can just call and share your perspective in that way. And, uh, you know, beyond that, I think another good place to start is to simply um, give the Montana Association of Conservation Districts a call and learn more about the effort and share your perspective, however it's most convenient to share it. There should be a way for just about anybody's time schedule to engage and to participate. It's not just the folks that have, are passionate about, hey, we, we need a new program or we need more research. It's also the folks that may have some concern about redundancy or just too much going on or, you know, being careful not to waste resources, being careful that we're really are like paying attention to Montana specific context. It's also those folks that I really hope will participate and share their perspective. So yeah, thank you, Mike, for the opportunity to share this with you today and to be on with Linda and Marnie. Great. Well, it's been a, it's been a good conversation and thanks. Thanks to all of you, Marnie, Cole, and Linda for joining us today and helping us understand what you're working on in the Montana Soil Outreach Program. Certainly, I wish you the best of luck in getting your effort going and farther along. To our listeners, I hope we've piqued your curiosity about soil health, some of these other state programs. Is there one in your state? If so, maybe you'll consider supporting it or joining it. And if not, maybe you will be the person who can help start one yourself. And if you'd like to learn more about soil health, I can't think of a better place than the ATRA website. And if you go to our website, you'll find dozens and dozens of publications, videos, podcasts on soil health, covering everything you can imagine from composting to nutrient cycling to soil testing to managing soils for water and many, many other topics. Uh, thanks again, uh, Linda, Marnie, and Cole, and we'll see you all next time. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Rich Myers. ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana. It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.